Anoush Bagdasarian is a 2017 CMC graduate who full majored in psychology and Spanish with a sequence in Holocaust and Human Rights Studies. While at CMC, she made the most of her opportunities in the Group Lead Center for Human Rights, working, on, working with asylum seekers, victims of human trafficking, Holocaust survivors, and scholars of genocide and, and crimes against humanity. With the help of the Magoublian Center, Anoush has interned at various human rights organizations throughout her undergraduate career. In addition to these wonderful experiences, Anoush is a published author of historical fiction play about the Armenian genocide entitled Found, which has been presented at book events in California, New York, Uruguay, and Argentina, as well as produced for stage production in New York and California. She is also in the beginning stages of writing a play about the experience of Syrian Armenians as her in uh, action project for the Humanity in the Action Fellowship, uh, based on the testimony she collected this summer through the Davis Projects for Peace, Peace Grant. Next month, Anoush will return to Armenia to intern with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and continue to document the testimonies of Syrian Armenian refugees with the goal of working on international issues of genocide, forced migration, and crimes against humanity. Anoush plans to continue her education. She will pursue a master's in human rights studies in September before attending law school the following year to study human rights law. Anusha's academic presentation is co-sponsored by the Relay Center for Human Rights, and I was very more than honored to, to walk with her. So thank you everyone. Um, first I want to say thank you so much for being here. I, this place is home to me and I, I can't describe the warmth and the happiness and the joy and um, the humility that I feel to, to be here. So thank you all for, for being here to make this possible. Uh, more specifically, I also want to thank Kathleen, Priya, Lydia, Dave, everyone who made this possible here. And uh, of course, the Mobile Bay Center for Human Rights, Catherine, Kirsty, Professor Apple, um, not just for this talk, but for my past four years. Uh, my time with the Human Rights Movement and Center for Human Rights has shaped my career, and I don't know if I'd be here doing what I am without it, so thank you. Uh, and then, importantly, the Davis Project for Peace Grant I have to thank, because they're the ones who really made this go from a piece of paper to uh, reality. Uh, so thank you to Bonnie Davidson, who's a fellowship advisor. Anybody who wants to apply for the Davis Project for Peace Grant next year or any other fellowship, you might there. Um, and thank you also to members of Napier, um, Janet and Barbara, and, and <coughs> thank you for, for being here and for also helping with this uh, process this last year as a Napier fellow. So, uh, coming home, documenting 100 years of displacement of Syrian Armenians. Uh, my partner in this project was Ani, she's from Florida, she graduated the same year as me. We created the uh, Armenian Student Association here in Claremont together um, with Ani, she was one of the uh, advisors to the club. And uh, we went to Armenia together this summer to document the testimonies of Syrian Armenians. Now, I want to ask you, did you all read the uh, story in front of you, the testimony in front of you? Um, now, remember that history, and, and let me tell you, let me ask you this. Uh, what if I told you, statistics, if I told you that 1.5 million Armenians were killed during the Armenian genocide, uh, perpetrated by the Ottoman Turks in 1915? Or what if I told you that until the beginning of the war in Syria, uh, the number of Syrian Armenians there was estimated to be between 60,000 and 70,000, but now there are only 15,000 Armenians left in the country? Do, do you feel anything? Can you see an individual face or a story through these numbers? Does this mean anything to you? Let's shift perspective. What if I told you that in 1915, Antanam Basilosnan, wife to the prince of the Sudanian dynasty of Zaytun in Armenia, took her life by jumping off this side of Tushayat so as not to die at the hands of the Turks during, or the Ottoman perpetrators during the genocide? Or what if I told you that Angela Jemian had to flee Armenia with her three children after her husband and father-in-law were uh, kidnapped and killed by members of ISIS, uh, and then they would call her house to, to threaten her and her kids, uh, and so she fled to Armenia. 
Do those stories reach you in a different way? Do you feel something different when you hear them? To me, the power of testimony and, and humanizing these, these numbers and these statistics uh, is, is very important. And that was the uh, beginning push of why I decided to carry out this project. Uh, so when I was in my freshman year in <coughs> Human Rights and Genocide class with Professor Lauer, uh, we learned we read a book called Inventing Human Rights by Lee Hunt. And she talks about how the rise of the novel in the 18th century uh, was what gave, what, what gave rise and gave momentum to the human rights uh, way of thinking and uh, the ability to empathize with others and understand others and uh, uh, see the point of view of somebody different that maybe you never come into contact with because of class difference or race difference or whatever it might be. And so uh, Lynn Hunt uh, says that you know, you can identify with the other and empathize through recognizing shared human feelings and experiences. Uh, and so I think that storytelling is a really important way to help people uh, understand what another one is going through. And so that's why I gave you all the profiles in front of you so that instead of you just having the statistics that I'm going to go through next and instead of you just having um, the five videos I'm going to show, you also have another story. And this one was more personal because I gave it to you. And so maybe when you think about Syrian Armenians, the person you read about will uh, pop up in your head and you'll remember, oh, I do know something about the Syrian Armenians. Uh, so before I, I, want to I want to spend most of the time showing you uh, the videos and the testimonies that we collected. But I also want to uh, talk about the inspiration for this project. Um, when I say 100 years of displacement, I say that because the communities that uh, have left Armenia, uh, I mean Syria, this Arme Syria, Armenians who have left Syria, are the ones whose ancestors fled during the Armenian Genocide. So uh, they were in Turkey, or, or uh, Western Armenia, historic Armenia, uh, and then during the Genocide they had to flee to wherever safety they could find. And a great uh, majority of them, found, a great amount of them, found sought refuge in Aleppo, Syria. Uh, and then, now due to the civil war, while it's a different type of displacement and different type of movement, they still are forced to flee their homes and move once again to a new home. And now, a lot of people might be saying, "Oh, well, they're going back home. They're going back to Armenia." Except it's a different region. It's not really Armenia. Uh, at the end, I'll show you a map, and I'm going to ask you which one of the locations is home. But um, Armenia, uh, modern day, is not the Armenia that they came from. And so there are many different traditions, or not traditions, but, but different dialects and different cultures. Armenia currently uh, uh, had a 70-year period of Soviet rule. And so the Armenians who left during the Ottoman Empire, during the genocide, didn't go through that. So they have a very different... Um, experience maybe of what it was to live in that region. So uh, the inspiration for this project was uh, based on the fact that the stories were not collected that well 100 years ago during the genocide, and given the fact that that lack of testimony allows denial today of the genocide, uh, I didn't want that to happen again. I, I, I wasn't alive 100 years ago. I couldn't uh, do anything to help. I couldn't uh, collect those testimonies. but. Today I am here, and while my uh, effort is not going to be the, the thing that changes everything, it's going to be something that's a part of uh, something bigger. And so um, I wanted to collect these testimonies so that, um, for example, Larissa's writing a, a, her thesis this year on, um, on a, a, a rape as a weapon of war and genocide, and she is uh, starting with different case studies, but she has to start with the Holocaust because she doesn't have enough uh, information or testimony to start from the Armenian Genocide, which is considered the first uh, genocide of the 20th century. And so for those reasons, uh, or not just that reason, but as that as one of the reasons um, that this information is so important to collect these testimonies so that this doesn't happen again. Um, so the four categories that I wanted this project to help with were historical, aid, judicial, and humanizing. So I already spoke about the humanizing potential where, you know, um, you can feel something when you read a story rather than just hearing numbers. Uh, so that was really important to me, to hear these voices instead of just hearing the 20,000 Syrian refugees. 
um, historical, there are so many different questions that can come out of this. So, for example, what was an Armenian um, community like in the Middle East? Aleppo was a community in Syria, is a community in Syria, but um, it's, it's dwindling. Less than, uh, more than half of the population is gone, uh, Armenian population. And so, uh, it was a flourishing a, a sort of city back in the day with Armenians, and I'll show you the videos. But how uh, are we going to remember this history and, and keep it if we don't write it down or document? So historical was one of the aims. Uh, and more outside of just Armenians, we also asked questions like, uh, what, did you notice any difference in the political climate before, before uh, the war? And so anybody, any uh, thesis student or historian or uh, um, analyst who wants to go through these interviews and, and document all the 81 answers to the question of, which church did you go to in Aleppo, or, or what was a religion like for a minority in a Muslim country? Uh, they can go through and have a, a set of data here. Um, so that's historical. In terms of aid, hopefully this can help. Uh, the, at the end, we ask, what do you need uh, from uh, Armenia? How is Armenia treating it? And so hopefully the organizations who want to give aid to Armenia and give aid to these refugees can know and have a better pointed idea of how to do that. Judicial. Uh, in the past, you know, 50 years, there have been uh, at least three that I can think of uh, important tribunals that opened up to punish uh, crimes against humanity and genocide. And so, uh, the ad hoc tribunal uh, for the Rwandan genocide, for the Bosnian genocide, and then the International Criminal Court. And so, if something were to open up in Syria uh, or open up for Syria about war crimes in Syria, these testimonies would be there for the investigative uh, research purposes that would serve the lawyers. Um, <coughs> And these are just a sample of the uh, uh, questions we asked, and the, we asked in five categories. Your genocide history, your life in Aleppo, pre-Civil War, uh, the war period, how you escaped, uh, uh, relocation in Armenia, and life in Armenia. Uh, so these are some of our partners in Armenia, uh, and uh, we're also working with the Pomegranate Foundation, which is in California, to help archive the different stories, and so they're going to be one of our main sites for archiving, as well as um, we're going to have our own website and hopefully be able to submit these testimonies to the Zorian Institute, which is an Armenian Institute of Canada, or the USC Shoah Foundation, etc. Uh, so these are just some facts. <coughs> I don't want to go into the stories. But uh, according to the UN Refugee Agency, in 2016, the Republic of Armenia was home to the world's third highest refugee population per capita. And until the beginning of the crisis, uh, Syria and Syria, the number of Armenians was estimated to be between um, um, 60 to 70,000. 100,000 was when it was at its high point, um, but that wasn't right before the war. Uh, and 20, approximately 20,000 Syrian Armenians left for Armenia and are now relocating their home, Armenia. Um, and uh, the rest have fled to uh, Europe or wherever else they could go. And uh, there's about 15 to 30,000 Armenians left in Syria. Uh, so it's impressive that 25% of Aleppo was Armenian back in 1920. I mean, that was also uh, relatively close to when the genocide ended. But um, now there's much less than that. And uh, the community is, a lot of the interlocutors or interviewees that I spoke to didn't believe that Aleppo could ever get back to its point of uh, uh, its point of success or its thriving nature that it had. So it's important to hear their stories and capture this moment in history. Uh, so the genocide. Um, well, I think maybe it's similar that 100 years ago what happened is similar to what's happening now that we have to move. But what do the interviewees have to say? Well, a lot of them uh, told me plain out that uh, directly that it was not uh, similar at all. This is a completely different situation. That was extermination. This is a war and they rejected any similarity with the genocide. But others uh, gave this answer that uh, the Armenians, so I asked, do you think that in any way what's happening now in Syria can be connected to the genocide? And this, this boy here, 20 years old, Levon, said yes, one way. It's the unluckiest people. Our bloodline is very unlucky. How do you escape genocide in 1915 and then after less than 100 years, you're back at it again? It's just being unlucky, that's the connection <coughs> for me. So I wanted to know, well, do the Armenians in any way have something special because of their history with the genocide? Have they learned anything or 
you know, maybe something was passed on through generation uh, about how to survive in times like this. So I said, do you think the experience of Armenians 100 years ago helped them in any way to prepare for today? And he said, when someone's grandmother has been through this and now it's your turn, you have experience and you know how to deal with those things. So Syrian Armenians have adapted because, uh, adapted better, sorry, than the Syrian people, the Arabic people, I would say, yeah. Armenians are like, this is a problem, now we have to deal with this. To other Syrians, having to face a problem like this was new. When that problem happened, they didn't, oops, sorry, they didn't know what to do. Some stayed, some made bad decisions from staying or from going to Turkey or having to escape by boats, but it's all based on decisions. And I think Armenians made the best decisions because of our past experience with it. <coughs> we also had an easy route coming to Armenia. It was the safest place for us. So we have been unlucky and lucky to have Armenia. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with the Armenian genocide, this was um, you know, the route of deportation and different exterminations. And so this, um, you know, all was the Ottoman Empire here, but now um, you can see the divide here. So the Derzor Desert was where they would take them to the um, to do the death marches, and so a lot of them came from cities all over, down to Derzog, uh, and Aleppo is over here. And so, uh, and our modern day Armenia is over here, so you can see they are different regions. If you came from this region, you're not going back to your home by going over there. Um, so now we can speak about um, uh, Vantanush, who's a, uh, she was born during the genocide, and she was the oldest person we interviewed. And it's an Armenian subtitles. I don't get I see Chartia dinner? Yes, Chartia dinner. He can shoot or send you Now, Tom is going to speak about the, what life is like in Syria. 
Yerbek Arab Airways should function as an acquired because all the Armenians were living at the same place. Everything. Khanuspana Hayer, Prabana Hayer, Goshkakara Hayer, Tersaka Hayer. Men, Arab Iranian Benchin Kunina. Armenians were living collectively, collectively. They were with, with each other. And Armenians afterwards used to say, why you are living alone? I used to say, we are trying to live alone in order to remain Armenians and not to be with the Arabs, you see. Afterwards, we were obliged to live together. But when we were a small uh, people, we didn't uh, no, even we didn't know the Arabic language, you see. At the school, when the Arab men, the Arab teacher were, used to come and say, this is an Arabic country, we didn't understand. What does it mean? What is that? Arabic country. Everyone was Armenian in our collection, you see. That's why our generation, till now, didn't learn the Arabic language very well. We learned to speak, we learned to uh, read Arabic, but only the newest generation was obliged to learn uh, baccalaureate in the study to have the time to go to universities Arabic universities, they began to go because they learned the US generation, our generation, till now, they took the Arabic language very well. We were not in use only when they began, began when we began to be citizens in the country where we were living, we were obliged to have uh, the card, uh, citizenship card, and Every Armenian name was uh, wrote mistakes, with these mistakes, you see? Um, so, Taurus is an example of someone who was very, uh, very, very uh, cultured and, and intelligent and, and still is, and in Armenia, uh, was able to continue at, uh, with his culture and uh, with his, his, his uh, sharing his intelligence. He showed us all his books afterwards. Um, one thing I want to mention also is that, uh, yes, he says that he lived in an Armenian community and that everyone was Armenian, uh, but you know, they weren't, they all went to Armenian schools and Armenian churches, but you weren't allowed to teach Armenian history in uh, the high school or the school. You had to go to the Agum, which was like the cultural center, to be able to learn uh, about Armenian history, Armenian culture. And in one of the sheets, I don't know who might have had him, but uh, one of the uh, men speak about that and they say that, and because Syria was such a, uh, they called it the land of overthrowing governments, that every uh, every couple of years or whatever or so, um, the government was overthrown by the government, and so if you were to teach the history or the culture of another group, that was threatening to them in life. So uh, um, it's interesting that he talks about being Armenian so much, but then you're, oh, but then you're uh, cut off from some types of Armenian uh, studies. Uh, this is showing what Taurus was talking about. So, uh, you know, many of the Syrian Armenians came from Aintab, which was a town in, in Western Armenia or Eastern Turkey. Uh, and Aleppo is now Syria, but before they were both just the same land. So they were just going from one city to another. They didn't, they didn't, there was no Arab or Christian or Muslim or whatever it was. Uh, and then you see the border now with the red line. Uh, they crossed into a, uh, you know, becoming Arab citizens when it changed, you know, around 1920 when Syria became uh, Syria. So, uh, Sehan now talks about, um, you know, what it is to, to be Armenian and how her neighbors, uh, she got along very well with her Muslim neighbors, but then there was a small ethnic difference. Yes, Hans von Murkir Hansen, Yeshat Urafen, Yev Amena Senk Zoravor, 
գրծությունը, կաղաքավարություն և այլն ու խտիպ հաժի մեջ կբարկանիր, ինչպես կսեմ, հարկան կսի պր նույս պանում, բայց ավելի գյանքը, ավելի մոդությունը, պարեգամությունը, � Հայլացքությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությ
It was awful. They had to get out of there, and uh, we then interviewed them a week after they arrived in Yedalon to live there. Uh, and they were so hopeful, and, and it was an incredible story. And just so you see why it was so difficult for them to get out of Aleppo, uh, you know, all these different regions are controlled by different groups. And so Aleppo is the red group on the top, and the red city on the top, and um, everyone around her is a different group, so it was very hard to get out to get down to homes. Uh, so then I'm not going to play this one, but basically Zohar talks about uh, loving living in Armenia and she feels Armenian. She doesn't feel like she, uh, you know, came as a refugee. She feels like she really be pre to Armenia and Armenia is her homeland. And that was, you know, an overwhelming, so a lot of uh, people did say that they missed Syria, they would go back to Syria, but an overwhelming amount really did say that they felt so comfortable here in Armenia and were very grateful for Armenia to exist. Uh, this is a, a map of different Syrian businesses that have opened up in Armenia. Uh, they're really doing well. And this is just our next step. So we are transcribing and translating all the different testimonies, uh, the 81 testimonies that we've collected. Uh, we're working with, we worked with translators during the process, and now we're working with um, uh, wonderful people in Armenia who are helping us transcribe, and, um, and then we're going to subtitle, and then, of course, we're archiving, and then we're going to, this summer in Armenia, if anyone's around, uh, we'll be doing a press conference in Armenia. Uh, and then I'm going to be going back to collect more testimonies, most likely, um, uh, definitely this summer. Uh, and just some themes that were that were really um, strong in the in the interviews, across the interviews, was that they were really glad of being in the place of refuge. They got along well with their Muslim neighbors in Aleppo. They emphasized keeping a very tight Armenian community in Aleppo. Um, they were upset about the lack of uh, um, a job in our jobs in Armenia and the too high rent. Uh, no one was sure when the war would end. It was a big question mark. You would ask, and nobody would know. Everybody's answer was, I don't know, I hope soon. Um, and in Armenia, they created their own Syrian Armenian communities. Oh, so these women down here, uh, they went to the priest of this church and they asked, can we have our own uh, Badalak, our own service, um, for ourselves on Fridays because the church was too crowded with them and the Armenians from Armenia. And so they, on Friday, go to their own, and then they have their own lunch hour afterwards. And then here's the Syrian Armenian restaurant. Everyone's Syrian Armenian is eating there that night. Um, and is Aleppo safe today? Well, this woman right here in the middle, she opened her own restaurant in Armenia. And she went back to Aleppo in November. And here's some of her pictures. And it, what struck, struck me was that look at how they, they're putting on this facade, right, that everything's great with the tourism and uh, the government's trying to make it look good. But this is the reality of it. Uh, and just today, the UN declared a ceasefire um, uh, in Syria because just yesterday there were more uh, airstrikes. So I don't know when it's going to be safe. But oh, I want to ask you guys, you know, which set of dots is home? The ones in Syria, the ones in Turkey, or the ones in Armenia, or all of them? Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, thank you all for being here. Right? So it's a very small percentage of the 20,000 Syrian Armenians that are there. So there could be many more stories like that, but of the people we spoke to, they were the only ones who went to Artsakh. Huh? They were through this organization, um, through an organization they were promised uh, if you are an Armenian family who was able to get to Artsakh, they would give you uh, land and a house. And eventually, and I don't know who has her paper, but if you see, one, well, somebody might have it, she talks about how she fought and fought and fought, and finally they gave her the $1,200 she was promised. But uh, she, um, the majority of people we spoke to got to Armenia through a Aleppo NGO, and so Aleppo NGO brought them to Lebanon. So we actually, there were a lot of families in Artsakh, we didn't get to Artsakh to interview them, but this summer I think I might go interview the families in Artsakh who are living there, and I'll get back to you. Thank you. You mentioned, obviously, the perspective of the Syrian Armenians going back to Armenia or going to Armenia, because most of them don't have a memory of it, obviously. They would have no memory unless they had visited at some point in their life. But 
What are you planning to interview, or did you get a sense from Armenians who've always lived in Armenia and now are being, you know, the recipients of a lot of newly settled Syrians? What their feeling is, and is there animosity, or is there kind of a graciousness of we understand this problem, or we understand how to host you? I don't know. But what do you feel about the people who already lived in Armenia receiving displaced um, people? That's a good question. There was a mixed, uh, a mixed reaction. So some people, it's in, in Armenia. There's already a problem of uh, a lot of people going to Russia to find work or this kind of brain drain because uh, there, a lot of the, the youth my age who I spoke to in the Armenian uh, Student Association told me that, oh, I studied engineering, I love engineering, but I'm going to be a shoemaker because there's no work in engineering in Armenia. Um, and that was, uh, so that was, there was a little bit of animosity there where all these Syrian Armenians are trying to come and uh, we don't even have jobs for ourselves. Uh, but on the other hand, there were a lot of people who uh, were so welcoming, you know, these are our family, I'm so glad that, not actual family, but you know, this is our family. Um, they're Armenian, any Armenian should be welcomed back into Armenia. Um, and um, they, there are a lot of Armenians who are working with Aleppo NGO and Mission Armenia and the aid organizations that are helping Syrian Armenians. So um, I, there definitely was animosity though, and I can't give a definite answer, but um, um, it's definitely dem demonstrated where the Syrian Armenians made their own communities of Syrian Armenians, right? Why, why did they make communities of right. Armenian Armenians? And they do, they do intermix, but also um, it's, a, it's a difference of, I guess, maybe also being a diaspora in Armenia and an Armenian who went through a, a rule of 70 years under the Soviet Union. So maybe there's even differences um, uh, there that, that you want to be with people who are more like you. And so maybe it's not a question of animosity, but a question of familiarity, and, and they separate because of that. Great presentation, as always. <laughs> the focus obviously has been in Aleppo and Syria, but I would surmise that at some point your research has taken you across the border into Turkey, or at least you've attempted to do that, perhaps not. But if so, what reaction have you received from Turkish officials or members uh, attached to the Turkish government? Um. So the only time I've ever been to Turkey was when I, I went there as my own pilgrimage to uh, see the town that my family was from. Uh, but I have, you know, actually, I, I was on a phone call at the beginning of the summer with a human rights defender from Turkey who was actually put in jail, Osman Kavala is his name, and he was jailed a couple months ago. I'm sorry, I don't know if he got out or not. Um, but when I was talking to him, he was so interested in collaborating with this project, and he works with a lot of people. Um, he works with the Hadam Dink Foundation, which is a foundation of a, a Turkish journalist who was killed for writing about the Armenian genocide. Uh, and so he works with that foundation as a human rights activist in Turkey pushing for human rights. And so he wanted to uh, do co a collaboration where the stories that we collected maybe we turn into like children's stories where the children that he works with in Turkey could then learn about their neighbors in Syria and what's going on in Syria and uh, the plight of the um, Syrian Armenians are just, without giving a title, just Syrians in general. You don't have to categorize as an Armenian. This is a Christian, this is a Muslim. Um, and so from that angle, I know that um, there are people who want to be involved, who want to help, but then there's also the angle that Turkey uh, is helping the rebels, and the rebels are against the government, and the government, Armenia supports the government, but the Armenians most of them support the government, and so uh, your question was, was how does Turkey feel about? Well, any personal experience that um, you've had, really I was in quest of Turkish, I was assuming Turkish officials would deny the yeah. genocide yeah. or be very negative in, towards anybody attempting to research it. Yeah, um, I, I agree that's probably what the demeanor is, but I mean, I don't. I, that would be maybe for the Turkish government, but I'm sure Turkish Turkish people in mm. general are, are very different. And I, but I haven't attempted that um, because many Armenians are not going to Turkey. They're coming to Armenia or going to. Um, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, the older gentleman, and then right after that, we had the younger girl, the older gentleman, talking about 
how isolated the Armenians lived. They wanted, they didn't have to learn the language. They didn't have to interact with any local Arabs. And then, and then the younger gal came on right after and said, Muslims are my friends. I, I see them all the time. We, there's no such thing as you're an Armenian. I'm a Muslim. We're all Syrian. Um, do you do you know what happened to change that whole way of thinking? Uh, if you can address that, or what what do you think happened? Uh, so what I, what I think, and from the other testimonies I've got, I've heard and uh, collected. Um, the the Toros was part of the generation who had just cut an older man came who just you know come from the genocide his family he was born you know with parents who had survived the genocide and um, they came with a mentality that the Muslims were enemies and that they had just exterminated them and um, they had a different outlook another woman we interviewed she said that she had learned in Syria or at school when she was talking to a, a Syrian student. Uh, on the street, and then the teacher asked her, why were you talking to that student? And she said, oh, I don't know, it's my friend. And the teacher said, no, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get this correct, but she said, no, uh, you know, Muslims are like a, a, a bad apple. You can't pick it up and put it in your pocket. That's ungrateful. Um, and a lot of that comes from hearing the stories of your own parents or your own um, family members telling you that your whole family was killed by these people. But then I think once you started living with them for years and, and the next generation came, these were your classmates, these were your, um, your playmates. And when you became, you, you saw them more as just, like when you come to a new country, that's the other, I'm not going to talk to them. But then as you grow up with them, they become less of the other. So I think because she's from a, the next generation, she was born interacting more with, with uh, uh, not just Armenians, and so um, she has that outlook. But, and that was the majority of the, of the people's outlook, that they had no problems, they were work partners with the Muslims and the, and the Syrians, and they were um, schoolmates and everything. And it's just the older generation that you see that says either directly, outwardly, you know, is um, anti-Islamic things, or they say just that they kept to themselves. But see, that's another good research question that you could do from these testimonies. Yeah. Have you done a TED talk? Now, <laughs> Wait, when I collect more, maybe. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Any, any students want to ask a question? I think they all had to go to class. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. That's cool. I'm not encouraged to ask a question. No, yeah. Yeah. I realize that uh, most of the Armenians from Aleppo they are working in restaurants or food business. Yeah. Um, find out. They were involved in other uh, businesses or uh, doctors or engineers or whatever if they were able to work differently in different fields. Um, that's a good question. Everybody that we met who had a business was a restaurant owner. Yeah. So uh, they either had a sandwich shop down the subway station. They're good cooks, by the way. Yeah. 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 Armenians from Aleppo, they are very good cooks. Their mm -hmm. food is very good. Yeah. Right, they just, you know, all the restaurants have been very, I went to each of them. <laughs> <laughs> For research purposes, of course. <laughs> and they were all very delicious. And um, you do that? the best food that I had in, Ar in Armenia. Um, and But but you're right, I, I didn't meet anybody. Actually, um, one woman who was a doctor back in, in Syria, she, um, when she came to Armenia, she just retired because it was hard. Uh, apparently, what I've heard, I don't know if this is just hearsay, what I've heard is that it's very difficult to become a doctor in Armenia. You have to have connections from when you're very young to, to get, I don't, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I heard. And so I think maybe the restaurant, because it, they knew it would be successful, was a good way to go. But um, most of the people we spoke to were either looking for jobs, having a very hard time finding jobs, or doing jobs that, like car repairman or um, mechanic or right, something like that. I didn't see any professions. Can I just yeah. quickly follow yeah, yeah, up? Go ahead. Add to that one. Another question. Yeah. Did you then notice in your very small sample that there were kind of um, certain profiles that determined who ended up where, who stayed in Armenia versus being able to immigrate elsewhere based on professional qualifications or based on having been middle class versus working class back in Aleppo? Did you find any distinction, or did you find actually quite a lot of diversity in the people who ended up? Um, 
good question. Uh, I have to think for a second, but I, I of course, didn't speak to anybody who went to Armenia and left, so I, I don't know what those people were like, but um, I know that the majority of people who did end up going to Europe, it's because their son had gotten there and they have a way in, or, or this person had gotten there. So it wasn't, from what I understood, based on trade or based on ability, but based on uh, connections. But, but maybe that's because those students did study Maybe they they were they were able to get a student visa in another country or something like that. Um, but no, it was all different. You know, some people had studied literature, some people had studied, um, some people didn't go to university. Actually, actually, a lot of the because we didn't uh, interview many kids my age. We interviewed uh, people who maybe were about to retire, and they um, mostly had not finished a high school education. They stopped around uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and so I think that that was the majority of people that we interviewed. Uh, and it was very few who had actual education, uh, further edu higher education or profession. Um, so maybe there is, some, maybe those who did pursue further education ended up somewhere else. That's a good question, also. But the majority didn't finish high school. Anush, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.